Oh my gosh. Uh, you are so inspiring. I mean, I have always thought of myself as, you know, like a pretty resilient person, but reading about your, your story, um, has left me in a space of total awe for you. You know, you're a mother of three, you're an author, you have so many other projects that I want to get into and ask about, and you became a, a widow at 34, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I can't even begin to, to wrap my mind around, you know, what, what that would be like, even without children, but especially when your children are, are so young and it's so impressive seeing everything that you have created and how that heartbreak, you know, inspired you. And, you know, so I would love to, to first ask about, well, let me, let me just start at the beginning, you know, so what, what was that experience like, you know, losing, losing your husband, you know, share, sharing whatever you're comfortable with. I know that's a really broad question. So, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, what, what was that initial, the initial impact of that and those are those first few days yeah I mean it was about as traumatic as you can expect it would be so um my husband and I have always been adventurers and explorers and pushing the limits of time and energy and um resilience really like we have just never set bound I, I catch myself because I still talk about it like it's present tense he's yeah. he passed away four years ago but I still talk about him and our relationship like this is how we are yeah. um so yeah but we had always there was never any limits on what we could do or um what we wanted to accomplish and so um we learned to scuba dive together in 2000 and 15. Um, and that became a big part of our relationship. We were both sailors. He completed a transpac sailing, um, which is sailing from basically outside of Seattle, Washington to Hawaii. Um, the year before he passed away, like our lives just revolved around the water, the ocean and adventure and travel. We had raised our kids to be the same way. They had visited at this point, they're four, six, and eight, and they've been to like 13 or 15 countries. Like we are, that's just our family dynamic. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, May 20th, 2018, um, he was an officer in the Navy. We were stationed in Honolulu, Hawaii at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, and he left for the day to go do a dive training. Um, and that was, you know, nothing unusual. Like this, that's great. Have so much fun. I love you. Um, you know, when we get, when you get home, we'll go take the kids for ice cream. Mm -hmm. Um, our kids were one and three and I was six months pregnant with our youngest that day. And he left and about, I don't know, an hour and a half after he left, maybe two hours after he left, my phone rang. Mm -hmm. Um, I was getting the kids ready to go shopping for baby stuff that we didn't have. And it was an unknown number. And I answered the phone kind of hesitantly, but, um, you know, as I write about in, in book one, like years of being a military spouse, you just kind of know when your spouse is in a potentially dangerous situation, if an unknown number calls you, you answer it. Like you don't, you just answer it. Yeah. So I answered it and it was the manager of the dive shop, um, just frantic and panicked on the other end um, saying, you know, is this Ashley? Is this, is this Brian's wife? And saying, yes. Um, he said, there's been an accident on the dive boat where are you? We're coming to get you. And, you know, here I've got a one and a three-year-old next to me on the couch, like rough housing or playing or arguing or being kids. And then I'm getting this news on the phone um, without any information, just there's been an accident. And mm -hmm. so, you know, as a diver myself, my immediate thought was, okay, he's either been run over by the boat and that was the accident or somebody else on the boat got hurt or, just trying to run through scenarios. Like it couldn't be that he didn't make it. That, that was an option. 
Um, and so they, you know, screaming into the phone, well, what happened? Where is he? Is he breathing? Like, I just needed to hear that he was breathing and he didn't know anything. He just said, we're going to be there in 10 minutes. We're going to get you. And so he came, picked up myself and my one and three-year-old, um, drove us through the streets of downtown Honolulu to the hospital. And, um, honestly, as I was driving there, my phone rang again and I answered it and it was a police officer and he's saying, I'm calling to talk to you about the accident of your husband. And I said, okay, well, is he, is he there? Can I talk to him? Is he breathing? And the officer said, nobody's called you yet. And then I was like, oh my God, no, nobody's called me. What's going on? And he said, well, we'll, we'll talk at the hospital. And then I'm just like, something bad's happened. And I get to the hospital. Um, I leave my one and three-year-old in the car with this stranger, the manager of the dive shop, who I don't know. Um, and I'm six months pregnant. I run across the ER parking lot. And um, within about 20 minutes, I had found out that he had died. Oh, Ashley. Yeah. I And I had no idea that you were pregnant at, at the time. And then with with childbirth, I mean, what was that like going through that Worse. intense experience? Yeah, was terrible. I was suicidal. I was trying to give myself outs. Like I can't even take care of myself right now. Like I have just lost the love of my life. Mm-hmm. That in and of itself was the most traumatic thing I've ever been through. And I've been through a lot of trauma in my short life, yeah. but losing him and then having to figure out to take care of myself, to take care of a funeral. My son's second birthday happened the day before his funeral. Um, taking care of my kids, like trying to answer all these questions. We lived on a rock in the middle of the ocean. We didn't have any family, any friends there. Mm-hmm. I had one friend there that was very helpful, but just no, no support, nothing there. Like I, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm pr- very pregnant on top of this. <clears throat> And then I find out my doctor says, well, you either have to stay here to have the baby or you need to leave in the next month because I'm not going to allow you to fly after this period of time. So then it was, well, what do I do? Do I stay here and bring this baby home to this just like devastatingly sad environment where I have nobody here? Or do I figure out now how to move myself, my dog, my two kids and my house off of Hawaii to somewhere else, but we're a military family. So it's not like we have a home base somewhere. Mm -hmm. Our family is all spread out. So it's just so much at once. Um, And I didn't, I didn't want to do it. Like I just, I was just in this headspace of, I cannot survive. I cannot survive this. Um, And yeah, long story short, I, I moved to Boise. I moved my kids and I to Boise within the month. Um, we moved in with Brian, my late husband, Brian, his sister and her kids and family, my dog, my dad flew and <laughs> flew my dog home, like just the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst. Yeah. But we did it. Um, about a month later, my daughter was born. Mm-hmm. It was excruciating. It was a terrible birth experience within that two failed epidurals. Um, my preeclampsia turned to eclampsia. Um, So my body systems started shutting down. It was just awful. It was pretty bad. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, and so understandable, right? You know, going through such a trauma and then, you know, it's like childbirth on the best day is so intense, but especially when you're already, you know, navigating so much. And, you know, so thinking about all that, I would imagine that it even felt difficult to breathe. And, you know, yeah, I mean, again, going back to that resilience, you were able to, you know, write your first book, The Ocean is Call- or no, The Ocean is Calling is your your newest book. Yeah. Correct. And then your your first book. Yeah. It's called Always Coming Back Home. Always Coming Back Home, right? Yeah. How, how you know, were you able to, you know, summon the re- resiliency to, to write that? And then did you find that writing process cathartic? And can you tell me a little bit about, about that book and yeah. the process of how that came to be? Yeah. So I, you know, a lot of, a lot of authors, a lot of people are like, I dream of being a, a writer. Like I want my life 
goal is to write and publish a book. Mm -hmm. And while I always kind of thought that would be cool, it was no, I was never a writer, like all through college, my professors were like, you're a terrible writer. Uh This is too colloquial. Like, yeah, yeah, maybe focus on something else. So I was never like a writer that was never in my, my plan to be a writer, but you know, I've always journaled and it's always been kind of a release. Like I need, I have this built up feeling inside of me and I need to get it out. So I would always journal. Um, Brian kept a blog as he uh, crossed to the ocean on the boat. And so he had kind of a big following of people. The Navy had followed that move since it was a military move. Um, We had a lot of eyes on our family and then he dies. And then we had more eyes on our family because here's this explorer just completing this big expedition. And now he dies in a big way also. And now I'm a pregnant widow. Um, so part of me felt like I had a responsibility to let all these people know that he had passed away. Mm -hmm. And part of me just had so much built up sadness inside of me. I knew if I didn't do something to try to get it out, that it it would consume me. Mm. That's the plain truth. It, It would consume me. So I started not even blogging. I started just kind of releasing like these things on Facebook. And I was just as raw and candid as I could be of, I just had to order a birthday cake for my two-year-old son on the same day that I had to pick up his dad's ashes at the funeral home. And I just needed to get it out. And so I started like writing on Facebook, um, part to update people and part to just release this from myself. And then Um, I started keeping a blog, especially because I knew, you know, there's like conflicting parts. There's like, I know this is the last pregnancy I'll ever have. This is the last baby I'll bring in here. I know if I survive this, like, I want to have some sort of like remembrance of this and the, the, it was pretty much all bad, but there were moments in there too, like feeling her kick or you know, bringing her home and people meeting her. There were moments along the way that I knew I wouldn't remember if I didn't write it down. So I started blogging. People really took to that just because of, of the rawness that I came at it with. There was no filter. I had nothing to lose. Like I was really on the verge of killing myself. So I had nothing to hold back. There was no reason to not share everything with people at that point. And that's not a very typical way of writing or of reading absolutely Um, yeah and so then I started blogging and then people just kind of really started encouraging me to write and I was like but I'm not a writer and they're like you are though like the stuff that you're sharing is how people need to hear what's going on um and then some time passed you know six months passed and I then realized I think I'm going to start forgetting some of this stuff. I I think if I don't write these down and don't capture these memories, like I know that they're going to change and distort over time. And because my kids were so young, they were never going to like remember stories of their dad. They were never going to hear the stories of us as they were. They were going to, rem- they were going to hear these stories as I remembered them five, 10, 15 years later. So that first book is really just mine and Brian's love story. It's it's captured as I remember it exactly as it happened and right after it happened and just capturing like as much as I could of our story so that my kids will learn about their dad and us um, in the most, most authentic way when they're able to. Oh, wow. Absolutely. And then, and then how what was the process like of getting to the, the ocean is calling, you know, what, what inspired yeah. your. Related. So the ocean is calling is more, um, it's more or less a sequel to always coming back home, but it's, it's its own story in that it starts where Brian dies and it follows my journey over the next year and a half. So, um, it includes when Brian died, I was like, well, I can never dive again. Like Brian died in a diving accident. How foolish for me then to get back in the water, mm-hmm. but diving is such a part of my identity and who I am. And it just fills my soul in like a way nothing else really can. And so it goes through the process of deciding to dive again. And I, I had his ashes turned into a living reef memorial. 
um, and had his whole dive team fly to Hawaii. And on the one year anniversary, we placed his memorial on the ocean floor and that was my first dive back. So I talked through that. I talked through meeting his organ donor recipient and becoming friends with her. Um, and then it leads up to and includes a two month backpacking trip. I ended up taking my kids on as um, like a healing journey. We did eight countries through Europe and just visited like very special places to our family that have very significant meetings, but all tied to the ocean, all tied to um, the meeting of past memories with the future of making new memories as a family. And so that's really what the ocean is calling is it's just um, about coming out of this like dark place and um, the things that we did, unconventional things that we did to work through grief, but in a way that makes sense for us. Right. And I'm sure that would be, you know, such an amazing source of inspiration for, you know, not, not just women, you know, with young children going through, you know, the death of the partner, but I, I would imagine anybody, you know, grieving, especially the loss of a loved one, but grieving anything, right. You know, following yeah. in your healing journey and hearing about all of the, the unique ways that, you know, people can, can process that, that heartache and, you know, and I know that through all of this, you've also started to rightly so teach about, you know, being resilient and how, how would you describe, you know, the, the most crucial pillars of, of resiliency? I think confidence is the first one. And when you're, you experience trauma in any capacity, your confidence is shot it's shaken you don't feel like yourself anymore you don't feel like you're able to accomplish the things that you were before that trauma and so that was my process was I knew I had to find my confidence back if I was going to do this mm -hmm. um so really just finding your identity or finding the new identity even at that it doesn't have to be who who you were before the trauma um, but just doing little things that really show you're making progress. For me, I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. I didn't want to get up out of bed. I didn't want to get out of the house. So little things, literally like taking a shower, getting to the mailbox that day. I mean, ridiculous things. But for me, it was like, okay, well, I did this. Now, what can I do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. um, and then asking for help too, honestly, like, being resilient is one thing, but you, you, to get there, you need the support of other people too. And I'm about as like <laughs> stubborn as they come, like as, yeah. um, just individualistic. Like I am definitely that person that's like, I'll figure it out. I don't know how to do it now, but I'm going to make it happen. Um, but I, I couldn't do that in this regard. And so I needed to lean on friends. I needed to lean on family. I needed to to learn to ask for help. And so I, to me, that's like admitting I'm not in this alone and being resilient is about utilizing resources. And a lot of those resources are other people who want to help you. And I would assume allowing yourself to, to be vulnerable, which is so scary Yeah, you know, to be able to, to reach out for that help. And then with your, with your kids, you know, can you talk a bit about how you supported them through that and any advice you would have for parents, you know, supporting their children through, you know, any, any kind of, you know, trauma? Yeah, I, I kind of met them in the middle. So I wanted it to be, they were in control. Mm -hmm. They were able to ask any questions at any period of time. Um, they were able to ask for help or not ask for help. They were able to tell me no if I tried to insert myself in something, but it was really important to me that they felt safe and that they felt um, confident and in control of what was happening to them at that point. They had no control over losing their dad. So that meant that they got control over the process of working through those feelings. Um, it's, it's still a continued process now. In fact, I asked my daughter the other day, you know, just to check it. We talk about Brian all the time. There's pictures all over our house. We watch videos of him. 
my younger daughter, she, Addie, she's four. She's who I was pregnant with when he died. She inserts herself in stories with him because she hears so many stories of him. And she's always like, can I see pictures of me and dad? And I'm like, well, here's a picture of me when I was pregnant with you. And here's dad. Or, you know, here's pictures of dad. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, really just letting letting them be in control of what they wanted to talk about when they wanted to talk about it, me offering stuff along the way and giving them the option to take it or to not. Um, and then actually because writing had been so cathartic for me and so beneficial, um, I sat down with them a couple of years ago, two years ago, and we wrote a children's book called A Hui Ho Until We Meet Again. Um, and that's a book written by kids for kids dealing with the loss of a loved one. And so that talks through their sights, sounds, fears of losing their dad um, and just paints a very realistic picture of this is how we're processing grief. These are the questions I'm asking. These are the concerns I have um, through a child's lens. It's not me telling them how to feel. It's not a psychiatrist telling them how to feel or a psychologist telling them how to feel. Um, it's not anybody saying this is how you do it. It's saying this is how it was done in this case. And here are some phrases you might hear, some things you might see. Um, yeah. What What is the um, the translation of, of the name of the book? Yeah, it means until we meet again in Hawaiian. Oh, I love yeah. that. That's beautiful. And um, and so I know that you started a, a scholarship. So Stay Gold for Brian J. Buggy. Um, can you can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So that's a scuba diving scholarship. Um, it was really designed for military personnel who spend so much of their lives away from their families, away from any personal fulfillment that they might want to accomplish because they're serving our country. Um, but Brian found a way to do it all. And so this is really an encouragement for other people that if they can make the time, um, then we can donate the money to that. So this is a scholarship for anyone who wants to learn to scuba dive in a safe environment. Um, they can apply for the scholarship and Brian will award them the chance to learn to dive. Oh. Oh, that's amazing. I, I was a, a rescue diver in um, on Roatan, Honduras oh, awesome. for about three years. And and yeah, I mean, just the 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 power of of scuba diving and just I mean that experience is just so indescribable. And yeah. and I met so many people during that time that were utilizing, you know, diving in one way or another to to heal from a you know range of of different challenges and and one woman she's like she described it as you know she's like diving is the only time where I feel like I'm able to leave that world where all of my pain all of my suffering is and come down to this you know she's like I pretend it's this completely different universe yeah, where it's you know, kind of <laughs> yeah right yeah and and she's like it's this little reprieve you know each time I go so um yeah. well, that's just so so amazing that, that you've yeah. created that. And then I also saw that you are a polar explorer with seaman <laughs> expeditions. What, what is that? That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, That's I'm so actually cute. getting ready to head out on expedition. So I'm a team of 34 women from around the world. We represent uh, nine countries and we are explorers, scientists, marine biologists, uh, master scuba divers, um, underwater photographers, videographers. I mean, really a range of just really impressive, incredible women. It's all women. Um, and yeah, we we go to remote locations of the world and we are documenting the um, climate change, the changing sea ice and seeing how that affects then the orca and the humpback whales that come to the area. So um, in a few weeks, we're headed to Trom outside of Tromso, Norway, which is north of the Arctic Circle. And we'll be out on expedition for about 10 days. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> oh, how, what a, what, it's what, pretty what, wild. In fact, doing? I've been like blogging about this yeah. recently because I know there's people who are like, it just, just, they don't understand it. Like why your husband died in a diving accident. Now you're going to leave your kids to go on this expedition. Like what is, 
speaking of kids, they're walking in the door now. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I mean, we're out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, people are like, why, why would you chance that? Why would you do that? And, you know, as a mom, like there is a part of me, obviously that has crazy mom guilt and is like, yeah, this is risky. There is a potential. I don't come back for this, but there's a bigger, an even bigger part of me. That's like, what is the example I'm setting for my kids? Like, this is a personal fulfillment journey, 100%. This is selfish. This is me doing something for me. This is going to feed my soul. This is something I get to have for me forever. But it's also teaching my kids through showing them that just because you're scared of something doesn't mean that that's a good reason to not try it Mm -hmm. or to not at least learn about it. And for them to have this story, you know, there's no telling what they're going to think when they're older, but I just imagine, you know, the example set for them of my mom's a polar explorer and she has traveled the world doing these things. And that's their baseline. That means like, this is what's normal for them. It's normal for them to, for us to be publishing books and to be traveling the world and to be doing uh, sea or exploration. That's, that's their baseline. So if that's what they are used to seeing, then I just imagine like what, (laughs) <laughs> what they're going to do yeah. on top of that. Yeah. And that is what makes me really excited um, and gives me like confidence that this is a good thing for all of us to be doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And how can people connect with you, learn more about everything that you're doing? Yeah, my website's probably the best, ashleybuggy.com. Um, Instagram, I post stuff all the time of where I'm at, what I'm doing. You'll see diving videos. You'll see videos of my kids probably picking their nose or doing something (laughs) weird. You'll see uh, my dog here in the background. He's in a lot of videos. So Instagram, Facebook, um, just look me up by name and you'll find me. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I'll add links to everything in the in the notes. Oh, well, Ashley, thank you so much. I mean, again, you're just such an inspiration and it's, yeah, it's just amazing hearing your story. No, thank you.